Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm going to do the, the main talk tonight. Uh, the title is When Customers Don't Share a Language. I uh, appreciate everyone's attention tonight. This is a bit of a test run for me. I'm going to be doing this talk at Domain Driven Design Europe in a couple of weeks. And uh, I was working on it up until about two minutes ago. So <laughs> thanks very much. I'd love to get some feedback at the end as well. Um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about a domain that we worked in uh, for a number of years and the journey that we went on in evolving our models to match that domain. And this was the first project where I had really made a commitment to use DDD and domain driven design you know, in, in a serious and a hardcore way. But before I get into the domain modeling part, uh, it's a really complex domain, a complex landscape. So I need to give some uh, context, some, some clarity around the landscape that we were operating in. And it was healthcare and payments. So two complex environments in the, themselves, but bring them together and the complexity um, goes, goes really high. So imagine at the very high level, the kind of interactions that you see in this domain are uh, a healthcare worker, sometimes called a service provider, um, and then you have somebody who's paying for the for the care. So in a lot of cases, if we go to a doctor or someone, the Australian government is going to pay. Um, and so the interaction goes something like, how much would you pay for me to do some service for this person, identified by in Australia their Medicare number? Um, and the government will come back and say, oh, we'll pay you $50 for this. And then presumably they go and do the work and then the government actually sends them some money. So this is a very high level of a common interaction between two of the key players in this landscape. But it, as I said, it's a bit more complicated than that. We do have an interaction between um, your, your standard sort of doctor and the Australian government, but we also have hospitals and they sometimes ask the government to, to pay for things. Um, but the government's not the only party that sometimes pays. You've also got private insurers. So I imagine a lot of people in the room have a private insurance policy and they often cover things like physiotherapy or what's known in the trade as allied health or dentistry. Don't ask me why the Australian government doesn't pay for dentistry, but that's a different topic. But they also sometimes provide services that hospitals cover. Uh, hospitals provide things like elective surgery um, that are uh, not strictly speaking necessary for your health, but things that you want to have happen. Uh, I personally had elective surgery last year and I dispute that it was characterized as elective because I've been in a lot of pain before I had the surgery, but there you go. There are these fine grained distinctions and decisions made about what isn't, isn't covered by the government and private insurance picks up a lot of the other stuff. But there's more than that as well. There are at the state level or sometimes at the, at the national level, organizations that are set up to fund specific situations. So perhaps if you uh, have a road accident in Victoria, there's a state government agency that will pay for your recovery. Uh, or if you uh, have an injury at work, there's a workers' compensation scheme that will cover the costs of your recovery. So the hospital is asking for payment from them. The general practitioner is asking for payment from them. The physiotherapist is often sometimes asking for payment from them. And then sometimes there's special government agencies or private entities that want to cover the costs of things like vaccinations. So maybe a pharmacy is able to provide a vaccination, but also pharmacies provide medication, which is covered under the recovery of a road accident. And they also provide medication that's covered under the Australian federal government um, systems. So you can start to see it's a complex landscape, lots of crisscrossing back and forth between these different parties. And you can imagine every single one of these lines is a different style of interaction, different form, different website, different paper postage process. We're going to take a step away from that for a minute to discuss probably one of the more complicated landscapes that I couldn't, didn't want to just shove it in on the right there because it's, it warrants its own slide, and that is the world of disability. Now, I want to just start by saying, and I've used the iconography of someone in a wheelchair. It's really important to note that everyone with a disability has a very unique and personal experience and not every experience is the same. Wheelchair users will have one experience, other people will have a different experience. And I don't mean to imply that everyone with a disability is in a wheelchair. It's just a standard piece of iconography to illustrate um, the experience of disability. Now, historically in Australia, the model for people with a disability was worked something like this. There was not even a question uh, being asked. It was just the government would go to an organizational service provider and say, here's a bucket load of money, look after this person for the next year. And then they would send them the money. And there was very little oversight or auditing. And the person with a disability had little clarity over where the money was going, you know, how much money they had access to or what it was being spent on. And certainly very little opportunity to dispute if they felt the money wasn't being spent appropriately and they weren't getting the services that they needed. So a bit of a diversion into disability theory. In the old days, 
they had what was called the medical model of disability, which was kind of like a doctor coming on and saying, okay, you have a disability, we're going to try and fix you. There's something wrong with you, we need to fix you. Um, and that's known as the medical model. It's pretty outdated these days, but you can imagine that was in place for quite a long time. As society got a little bit more, um, well, elements of society got a little bit more, I guess, empathic, there evolved the charitable model of disability, which, you know, it, it meant well, but it still had at its heart the idea that, you know, people with a disability need our help. So let's go and raise some money um, and we'll try and help the people with a disability. Um, but as you can imagine, that help office came from with strings attached or it was constrained. Um, and it certainly did not give the people with a disability much autonomy or choice over their lives. The next model that evolves really changed the landscape for people with a disability. It's called the social model of disability. And what it basically says is that disability is not an inherent characteristic of a person. It's a property of the relationship between a person and the society that they live in. So disability is about are elements of the world accessible to you? And so this is why accessibility has become an important topic, because the truth is that people with a disability can usually have exactly the same quality of life as everybody else, as long as services, infrastructure are designed with their needs in mind. So to give an example of how relational it actually is, imagine if you, as you currently are, were transported into a world where everybody else had night vision. Would that world invest in lighting? It probably would not. In that world, you would be considered disabled, exactly as you are right now. And I'm speaking to the people in the audience who do not consider themselves to have a disability at the moment. So how can it be that you, without any change to your body or your brain, can in a different environment be considered to have a disability? That's the fundamental truth behind the social model of disability, recognising that it's not an intrinsic characteristic. It's an interconnected, interrelated aspect of a society. And so what the social model says is that we should recognise that, and we should recognise that accommodations and adaptations to make things accessible are actually really important. And beyond that, there's another model called the human rights model of disability, which goes a step further and says not just um, should we recognise that this social model exists, but we should say that it's a fundamental human right to have things to be accessible. People should have the right to participate in society uh, in a full, um, present way with autonomy and choice and control over their lives. And so. What the human rights model suggests is that there should be legislation and regulations that empower people to deconstruct inaccessible systems in society and help rebuild them in a way that's accessible to all and with equitable access. And I don't think there's anybody, once it's explained in these terms, that would disagree that that's a fundamental and important principle. So thankfully, quite a few years ago, the Australian government listened to this model and it rolled out a, a dramatic change to the funding model for uh, disability services. They acknowledge that they can't necessarily go out and rebuild the entirety of Australian society to accommodate all the possible adaptations that might be needed. So what they said is each person needs an individualised plan for how they're going to have accommodations and adaptations to allow them to live a fulfilled life. And so what they did was they gave the person with a disability autonomy and choice over the money that was being provided to help them um, access services. And what that allowed them to do is to go to the service providers and ask for quotes and say, how much would you charge me for this? And to make a decision, if they didn't like the quote or they didn't like the person, they could go to another service provider and get a different um, quality of care or a different uh, service provided at a different price, because ultimately it was coming out of a budget that they had been allocated. So they might get back a quote saying that. When the service was provided, they would say to the government, can you please send this money to the person? Because uh, they did give some work to me and it's within my budget allocation, and then the government would send the money. So you can see how this now starts, incorporates the person with a disability in a key role in the decision-making landscape around what services they access and how the funding is applied. There's another aspect to this, which is the um, a lot of people with a disability have a community of care around them, maybe family members, maybe a professional organisation that supports them in accessing a lot of these mechanisms because for some people with a disability, even the requirements of interacting with different parties to facilitate these transactions is not accessible to them. So there are people to help them with that. And th those organisations, the provision of that service is itself funded um, under this model of payment, which is excellent. Sometimes it's a little bit different. Sometimes the government would even send the money back to the person and then it would be up to them to send it to the, um, to the service provider. So lots of different variations and I, don't, I won't get bogged down in the details of the policy, um, but I think at a high level, you can start to see how there was a real sea change 
in the way that the government and society started to think about uh, engaging, um, you know, supporting people with a disability to have equitable access to services and, you know, the opportunity to, to live a fulfilled life. So let's go back to our broader landscape. Why do we talk about disability in this context? We've just said that disability is not a medical, it should not be a medicalized issue. And yet all these other things I've talked about are really in the medical realm. Well, the reality is, is that while there are dedicated service providers to, to provide support to people with a disability and there are non-medical services that they need access to, like maybe transportation services, if they're going to a place that doesn't have you know, accessible access for them. Um, there are other services that are provided under a medical model and also provided to support people with a disability. Sometimes they need, um, you know, physical supports or they need physiotherapy or other kinds of therapy um, just as part of their day-to-day -day life. And so there is a lot of overlap with some of the service providers supporting people with a disability and other, you know, more traditionally medicalized clients. So we have a very complex landscape, as you can see, arrows crisscrossing everywhere. And as a business, we decided we wanted to embark on supporting this and simplifying it and offering a product to, to make this life easier. In the existing world, there was a competitor. This competitor had focused on a particular slice of the landscape, which was predominantly allied health, so physiotherapy, um, osteopathy, and things like that, and where it's funded by a private insurer. And you can understand why this was the case. Private insurers have a lot more money to spend. And so if you're a technology organization, uh, you can charge those private insurers to provide your technology platform. Uh, and so that's why that had been the area that had achieved, uh, you know, received the most focus and development. So as a business, we set ourselves a mission, uh, which was to support the success of the new disability funding model by facilitating transparency, efficiency, and ease of access to claiming and payments in this space. You know, we weren't doctors, we weren't service providers, we couldn't help in that way, but we were technologists who could build a great platform for making it easy for people to get paid, give transparency around how much money people had, and just try and smooth the call it financial elements of all of the processes. But we had a problem, which is the classic chicken and egg problem. Nothing that we did would be useful without multiple parties coming to the table. We couldn't, we didn't initially see that we could offer a service to uh, one of the groups in that landscape that they would get value of without other parties in the landscape having also come and engaged with our platform. This is classically known as a two-sided market or more informally as the chicken and egg problem. So we found a way to break the chicken and egg problem and we have to go back to this landscape to understand what we did there. Um, before all of the transactions take place, there was a conversation between the government and the person with the disability and their carers around, let's agree on a plan. What are your goals in life? And let's agree on what budgets are appropriate to spend towards helping you meet those goals. And this became known as the, the person's plan. And in this model, the, the person was known as a participant in the funding scheme. So you had a participant and they had a plan and the plan defined what budgets were available for them to spend on the services. So, there was an opportunity here for us to support those participants with transparency, at least, in managing their plans without necessarily having to engage lots of other um, stakeholders. So with that background, we're going to start looking at our actual DDD modeling journey and the system design to help fulfill that goal and the goals as they, as they evolved over time. So the first one was, I want to draw attention to something from Eric Evans' book, and this is a diagram where he talked about the concept of responsibility layers. We knew that there was a lot we didn't know about this space. We knew there was a lot of requirements we weren't, hadn't been able to uncover. There were a lot of stakeholders that we hadn't yet had a chance to speak with, but we kind of had a broad vision of what the solution would need to do. Um, and so at a very high level, came up with some responsibility layers to help us to find an organizing principle for how we were gonna come up with a design. And so Eric, to find uh, an example of some responsibility layers, um, things where you might have a layer that tracks what is the potential in your system, like a state reflecting the business reality of the resources that you have at your disposal, uh, operations layer, uh, state reflecting the business reality of what's actually happening, um, policy layer that specifies you know, business goals or laws, um, and the decision support layer with more analytical mechanisms. And so inspired by this, we came up with our own responsibility layers. Um, an administrative layer, which is about reflecting the reality of resources. So what are the plans that people have as participants and what are their budgets? Uh, an operations layer, which was about the actual activity of people submitting claims for payment and, and approving and checking that they match balances and other rules. Um, and then a finance layer, which um, managed the actual movement of funds.
high level strategic response, like large scale design to the system before we even had any details. And I think this was helpful because it gave us an organizing principle to think about it. One of the things Eric Evans does say is that almost well, certainly your first model will be wrong and you'll need to change it, um, but it can provide some structural support as you get started. And as we'll see, he he's as always right. So um, what we designed was a bounded context, notionally called provisioning to support that administrative layer, uh, a bounded context called claiming to support the receipt of claims, which was a request for payment from a service provider, and then a plan tracking context to help that core mission that I talked about, or that initial goal of giving visibility to participants about what their plan had in it, what budgets were there, um, how they were going with their spending, and you know what they had left to spend. And then a finance layer to facilitate settlement. So the arrows there are tracking the flow of events through the system. We built an event-driven architecture um, where data would come in to set up the structures in the provisioning layer. We'd publish events saying, hey, there's a new participant, or there's a new plan, or there's a new service provider. Uh, the other services or contexts would subscribe to those events and set up the data structures that they needed to support the rules that they had to follow, whether it's claim authorization or approval or tracking the, the budgets. Um, and then approved claims would fly up to the settlement layer to facilitate the actual payment for the claims that were supposed to actually happen. Okay, sorry team on the call. Uh, my phone was a bit silly again. No, sorry, my laptop was silly again, but I think my camera's come back, so you can see me now. Um, I'm gonna have to reshare the screen. Okay. I'll cut this out of the video that we upload to YouTube later. Um, yeah, so I was talking about the settlements uh, and then there was a recon we imagined a reconciliation context to help with uh, reconciling the movement of money uh, and maybe a billing context to help us work out how much we were going to charge our customers for this service because the billing context would subscribe to all the events and then compute you know what's happened and what should we charge for so it sounded like a great model right at a very high level this sounds like all the key elements that you would need and to an extent it was but it also illustrates the dangers of being too high level and too big picture because once you get down into the nitty gritty, you can start to see where you know, we needed more than this. But I am a big fan of starting with something like this because it gives you a framework to work with and a scaffold to work with. Just don't get too married to it because it's gonna have to change as we'll see. Now, what we were able to do is because we had set our initial goal is to support participants in managing their plans. We, built, we didn't build the whole system before we launched the product. We literally just bought this one context plan tracking and all of the data that needed to flow into it, we manually inserted into the database. So we launched our product with a single context and we knew there were going to be event flows into it, um, but we hadn't built the other context yet. So when our first clients came on board, we just inserted them into the database. We built an app on top of it and let them make use of it. And then over time, we built the claiming context, which allowed some of those interactions to happen automatically, the submission of claims at least. But we hadn't built the administrative layer at this point. So a lot of the setup of you know client, client records and provider records was still being done manually. So what did this look like uh, in an interaction model sense? We had service providers submitting claims via an API. Uh, those claims would get approved or declined in the claiming context. Approved claims would flow through to the plan tracking context to update the view model for what does your plan look like and it included things like forecasting. Uh, you know, if you keep spending at the same rate, when are you gonna run out of money? That kind of stuff. And so it was nice to separate all of that forecasting tracking activity from the rules engine of whether a claim should be approved or not. So I think this sort of, you know, it felt like we were on the right track with this breakdown of functionality. And we built this app, and you can see a nice little chart there showing this is how much you spent, uh, this is what you budgeted for, et cetera. And so we did start to get some uh, utilization of this. And so it might initially seem we didn't break the chicken and egg problems here because we still got two sides to it. But the way that we broke it was we were engaging with the service providers and allowing them to offer this app to their existing clients. So we didn't have to go up and sign out clients. The, the individuals were being prompted to use it by the service providers who said, if you use this, you can have more visibility over the activity that we're doing for you. Um, and so that got us a little bit of usage on both sides of the equation, which was good. Now, I haven't forgotten about the Australian government who's actually providing the money here. At this time, we did no interaction with the government. The people and the service providers directly interacted with the government to facilitate the payments. 
we were just trying to break the back of that chicken and egg thing by offering a service that the participants would get value out of. So I'm going to ignore the Australian government for now. Let's, let's hide that one. Um, but once we had built this context map and started and built this product, we had our first use case came along that we had just had no idea was going to happen, although maybe we should have predicted it. We had service providers that had not engaged with our platform, but who were still sending invoices to the participants, maybe by email with zero or by uh, you know with a PDF or in the post even sometimes. Um, and those participants were like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? I've paid this provider out of my money, but that expenditure is not being reflected in my tracking app. And that means that my forecasts are not accurate and that doesn't help me very much. So we thought, okay, well, we could allow you to record that into the app. Um, so yeah, the question mark, what's going on with my chart? It's wrong. Um, and the initial thought was, well, we've already got a context that does claim approvals um, and allows for submission of claims. So let's just update our app to start pumping these claims in. But there was a bit of a problem with that, which is that the claiming context had been built specifically for the use case of the service providers who were integrating via an API. They were doing a single one-shot interaction. They were just saying, here's a lump of data, process it. But the participants didn't want that. They had an app. They wanted to have a, a guided experience where they could search for the item codes that they were claiming for, where they could save their commonly used billers. So they'd have to re-enter the bank details every time. Um, you know, those common kind of user experiences that they would want. And we realized that whole experience needed its own context. So what we did was we built a new context called Pay Invoice, and it would accept the uh, claims and invoices from the clients um, and pass them onto the claiming context after it had, you know, when they were submitted. So it, it allowed us the opportunity to track draft invoices and submit them through. So the app was integrated with that. You can start to see why for dealers talk, the app started to get a bit more complicated and <laughs> was combining a bit of language, even though we had nice isolated languages in our backends. So this was pretty good for a little while, but we realized that the claiming context had started to, well, not just started, it had from the beginning, we just hadn't realized it served two purposes. One was it was processing API and bulk claims, and the other was it was checking all the rules. And the reality was is that they didn't necessarily need to be the same thing. And in fact, they shouldn't be the same thing. And I think this is a really great example of how you sometimes you cannot come up with an effective design until you've tried something that isn't right. And the key thing then is what do you do with that information? Do you just live with it or do you embrace it and change it? And thankfully, because we had uh, really committed to using DDD on this project, we changed it. So I'm gonna redraw this diagram. This version of it is not actually changed. It's topologically the same. The arrows are going in the same directions. I've just rearranged the boxes to make it easier to see what we did to, when we changed it. And what we did was we broke the connection between these contexts. We set up a new context called, which called the claims engine, and we integrated both of them into the claims engine. So we split it out. The rules checking migrated into the claims engine, and the processing of the API and the bulk upload stayed in the claiming context. Now, I'm not going to say that splitting the context in half in that way was super easy, but it was possible. It's possible because we committed to modular design within the architecture. We were using DDD concepts like aggregates and domain services and very modular components. And so while it wasn't trivial, it was actually doable you know, on the order of a couple of weeks, not months and months of refactoring. So if we, then the next thing that came along, and I'm gonna to have to move some of these contexts to the left a little bit to make room for the next concept that arrived, is that there were some service providers who wanted to use us, but they didn't have the in-house ability to integrate with the API. So a lot of our initial service providers were larger organizations that had their own IT shops, and those IT shops could integrate with the API. But then there were smaller providers that came along who didn't have that. So they wanted their own app where they could submit an invoice. Um, it couldn't be the same app as the participants because the participants were submitting invoices and saying, you know, this is definitely approved. I just want you to record, reduce it from my budget. But when the providers were submitting invoices, uh, there was still the possibility that it shouldn't be approved. Maybe they hadn't done the work yet or not. So there was a whole workflow around the providers would submit it, the participants could review it, and then say, yes, I did receive that service, and then allow the funds to come out the door. Also, while on the participant side, they wanted to track their frequently used billers, on the, on the provider side, they wanted to track their frequently used clients. So it was, while similar, a very different um, set of requirements. So we built a new context to support that, those interactions. And because we'd already done the refactoring and extracted the rules engine, it wasn't too hard to plummet into the claims engine. And it made us feel pretty good that this architecture was, you know, pretty fit for purpose for what we were doing at the time. We were able to extend it by adding new contexts and leverage the existing contexts in a way. And yeah, we had we did have to split one, but it was doable and the rest of it, you know, still kind of hung together. 
So that was all very high level, I guess, strategic architecture of the system. I want to dive into some tactical architecture now because I think it's quite interesting and there were some really challenging moments in the middle of it. So I'm going to dive into the claims engine because that was the most complex part of the system. So the key entity at the heart of it was the concept of a claim, which was a request for payment for a given service provided by a service provider of a participant. Uh, at a point in time, the service was identified by an item code um, and we had to check, is this claim okay? Can we, can we pay it? Um, so we built a domain service called a claim approver and it would build up a chain of rules because we knew that we wanted each rule to be modular we also knew that potentially as we engage with more funding models, they might have different rules. So we wanted to have this pro like dynamic process that could build up a chain of rules that would get evaluated. So for example, there was a service provider valid rule that would check the details of the service provider linked to the claim. And there was an item code valid rule that would check the details of the item code linked to the claim. And there were a bunch of other rules that would check related data. And I think this is interesting because it highlights that we couldn't evaluate a claim on its own. You can only evaluate it by referring back to this reference data. Um, and that was interesting, but it also you know, proved one of our biggest challenges over time, as we'll see later. Now, there was another really important rule, which was the sufficient funds rule, because of course you can't allow the money to go out the door and if, if the person's going to exceed their budget. And this is where we're going to take a bit of a deep dive into this, because this is quite challenging. To support that, when I talk about reference data, the reference data was the account balance. So we obviously had a concept of an account an aggregate in the DVD parlance that, that maintained the balance, because we need to check is the balance sufficient before we approve the claim. So much like all the other rules, which were you know, more data-driven rules, then there was a sufficient funds rule, which was also data-driven, but it was more about the participant's situation, not about the provider situation or the attributes of the claim. Now, we identified that the accounts model could potentially be quite generic. Um, we knew that when we did financial payments, we were going to need an accounting model as well. So we set out to build a generic double book entry accounting model at the heart of this. So what does a double book entry accounting model look like? Never th didn't think you'd be coming along and hear about accounting tonight, did you? It's much, I'm going to make accounting interesting, hopefully. Um, so we start with an account. We identify it as a liability or an asset account. Don't worry too much about what that means at this point. But it has a balance. And so we, when entities were established, like a new service provider or a new participant, we would set up a chart of accounts related to that entity. So the provider only had one account, which was, you know, how much do we currently owe them? Um, but a participant would have a bunch of accounts, one for each support category, um, which is, you know, what is for each goal effectively, each budget that they've been allocated, and one for the claims that have been received but not yet um, processed. And so when a, an account, when a claim was received, we would journal the receipt of that claim by debiting one account and crediting, crediting another account. And then when the claim was approved, we would again debit the support category account and credit the received claims account. So the received claims account would always settle back down to zero as the claims were processed, but it gave us visibility of what claims were in mid-flight, not yet approved. Um, and But in the meantime, once eventually the claim was approved, the, the support category account was debited and would drop in balance. And over time, you can imagine that balance would continue to drop. In the meantime, the provider payable account would increase until at the end of the day, we would pay them and then that balance would get dropped down to zero. So there was another journal that would happen when we actually sent the funds out the door. And so this was a really nice way of giving us clear visibility of where the money was flowing, who it was owed to at any point in time and what was going on. But if you look at this from a DDD perspective, you might see some complexity. So who, who, when I talk about the word aggregate in the DDD context, what does that make, make people think of? Like an idea of a, what an aggregate is in DDD? You don't want to be um, what you need to be or pay to be on go rather than little bits. Yeah, exactly. So the answer from the floor was um, something that everything needs to be updated in one go. So the technical term for that is transactional consistency. So everything within an ag aggregate needs to be updated in the database in a single transaction. Now, what we've identified is that each account is a separate aggregate and the journal is a separate aggregate. Now, I've drawn the journal entries inside the journal um, because it was really important that the whole journal was transactionally consistent. The debits and the credits must match up within a journal entry. It's a fundamental principle of accounting. Um, but you can't, according to the concept of transactional consistency, update two accounts and a journal at the same time, because that's 
that's making your transactional consistency boundary bigger than your aggregate. And the whole definition of aggregate is that is your transactional consistency boundary. So this, this gave us a lot of um, head scratching, literal head scratching at the time. Um, and maybe it was because we were, uh, you know, taking too literal a def an interpretation of DDD. Um, yeah, so Stephen's uh, commented the concept of an aggregate root. So yeah, the, each of these, an aggregate is like a potentially collection of entities and an aggregate root is the entry entity into that collection. But the aggregate as a collection must be consistent. So a lot of our aggregates had a single entity in it and that entity was the aggregate root, but the journal entity was one of the few that had a journal entity, which was the aggregate root, and then journal ent entries, which were ch children of that aggregate root. You could not directly access a journal entry. You could only access the entries via the journal. And that allowed the journal entity to own and encapsulate the business rules around enforcing the fact that the, all the journal entries needed to balance up. This is a really good example of an aggregate in action where the business rules need to encompass multiple entities. So you bring them all into the same aggregate and access it via the aggregate route. But, you, but there was no aggregate that encompassed multiple accounts and a journal at the same time. But obviously we wanted to record the journal we wanted to debit the balances, we wanted to update the balances. And I'll explain in a minute why that was important from a timing perspective. So let's go to um, more of an, uh, well, just to reiterate, if you've, this is where I think DDD gets to be complicated for people. One of the many areas that DDD sometimes get complicated for people. Um, because when you read about database transactions, when you first engage with them, one of the canonical examples is funds transfers. So literally the example here is a classical example is transferring money from one bank account to another. To do that, you have to first withdraw the amount from the source account and then deposit it to the destination account. If the money goes missing, that's very bad. Obviously that's true. So this is encouraging you to update both accounts and the journal all in one transaction. Does anyone know why that's not a good idea in a DDD model? So, so the reason that, it, sorry, is there an idea? No? The reason DDD encourages smaller aggregate routes is about concurrency. If you're updating too many things in one transaction and you have two requests coming at the same time, there's a bigger risk that both of them are going to try and update the same entity in the same transaction. And then you get a concurrency failure and one of them has to retry. Or as often happens in systems that haven't been built with that resiliency in mind, they don't retry and they just fail back up to the user with a 500 error. So DDD encourages, and there's a great paper by Vaughan Byrne, um, called Design Small Aggregates, which really explores this, this concept in detail about the value of small aggregates and how having small transactional consistency boundaries uh, allows you to interleave all of the concurrent requests and update parallel records um, you know, in, in parallel without worrying about uh, concurrency errors. And so if we had updated all of the two accounts and the journal in the same transaction, but the, but the provider had uploaded a bulk file and we were trying to process that in parallel, we would have had lots of concurrency errors on the provider account probably a lot less risk of concurrency errors on the participant account because the participant's not submitting lots of claims at the same time, but the provider might be because they might have multiple workers working in parallel. Um, so we couldn't, you know, we wanted to avoid that it was a risk, but we were quite head scratching. So from an event storming approach of thinking about what's going on here, you've approved your claim and then, sorry, this is an event storming model of how you would tackle this in a standard accounting system. Because the truth is in a standard accounting system, they often don't use the concept of a database transaction. They often are eventually consistent. Banks are eventually consistent. If you transfer money from your account to an account in another bank, they don't update both sides in one transaction. They can't, they're separate systems. With real-time payments like OSCO and stuff, they've done a better job of tightening the, the um, response times on real-time interactions. And they've got a more holistic workflow around making sure that the two accounts are in sync you know, in a short time frame, but there is no single database transaction that updates Westpac's and CBA's bank accounts at the same time, right? So real bank accounts are not transactionally consistent, notwithstanding the beginner's guide to database transactions, which suggests that they should be. So in reality, what typically happens is there's some sort of event that signals that there's a need for a transaction. There's a journal created, which is transactionally consistent and creates two journal entries. And then those journal entries, um, publish events, which lead to the balances being changed on the accounts independently. And so there's an eventual consistency thing going on here where the account balance is updated later. So is it a question? Is it like um, they make the balance unavailable, but the detection happens after some time? 
you are two slides ahead of me. <laughs> Good question, though. So there's a question about um, making uh, the balance unavailable. So this is, I guess, a standard accounting system. Like a zero probably works like this because for them, there's actually no strict need for the balances to be transactionally consistent. But for us, um, there was. Like, when do we actually check the balance? Because we had that sufficient funds rule, remember? When do we check it? What if we approve the claim with our sufficient funds rule when there's a balance that's due to be updated in because of an event that hasn't yet been processed? So this caused us a lot of consternation. This is what we did. We came up with a more complicated model. I wish we hadn't, but we did. Um, we came up with a pre-authorization concept. So before we created the journal, we would have a command go into the account, which would say pre-authorize the claim, which could either result in a pre-authorized event or a declined event. Uh, if it was pre-authorized, the claim approver would catch that and then pass on the fact that it had been approved to create the journal. Then the journal entries would be created and then the account balances would be updated. And in updating the account balances, we could remove the pre-authorization because that is part of the ag account aggregate at the time. So it was like a two-step transaction. We pre-authorize, reduce the balance, and that was transactionally consistent with the sufficient funds rule. Um, it was actually even more complicated than this diagram, but I we would spend all day just talking about what was really going on here. Messages flying back and forth, pre-authorization, pre-authorized, decline. Anyway, it was a whole nightmare. So it got quite complicated, but you know, technically it worked. But it was probably a red flag to us that we were on the wrong track here. What I wish we had done, um, we never did this, but I've been pondering this for years since because I wish we came up with a more elegant solution, was something I haven't seen many people do. Um, it's the idea of a transaction, a dynamic transactional consistency boundary where we actually say, look, the guidance to have a single transactional consistency boundary around an aggregate is good, well-meaning advice, but sometimes you need to break it. And the question is, can you break it intelligently? So I said, as I said before, there's low risk of concurrency failure on the participant account, and that's the one we actually need to check the balance of. And that's the one that the balance needs to be consistent on. So let's update the participant's account and create the journal in the same transaction. And if it's successful in the balance check, published claim approved and account balance changed and journal entry created, all those events coming out of the same transaction. And if it's declined because there's insufficient funds, there's no journal created, none of the other events are created and there's just a claim declined event. The account journal entry created would then allow the second account to update its balance at eventually consistency. And so this is being smart about which accounts, not treating all accounts as the same. Some accounts, eventual consistent, transactional consistency is important. And in that case, Concurrency was a low risk, so it was actually safe to broaden the transactional consistency boundary beyond just the the you know the single aggregate. I haven't seen other like other guidance around this in the DDD literature. Maybe there's some really bad ideas why you shouldn't do it, but um, anyway, I think it's an interesting idea to explore further. So this ends phase one of our journey. Yep. Uh, yep. Shouldn't there be three arrows going to the account number two? I mean. Uh, Shouldn't it no, because account number two, it only needs the entry journal event to update its balance. It doesn't need the other events. So, so what happens after? Oh, the other the events, they flow into other parts of the business process, like notification, notifying somebody or, you know, updating a state, on, you know, on a state machine or triggering a payment or something. So there was, you know, very much, this is a small part of a much longer business process, but just zooming in onto the... The, the transactional complexities. You mentioned state machine. Yeah, there was a there was a state machine in the claim to manage the transition through various states. Um, unfortunately, I have not elected to deep dive into that in this talk. Um, it's an interesting topic, but um, there's only an hour, so maybe another talk. <laughs> talk about state machines in aggregates. Um, so this was kind of, I guess, phase one over. We had our first broad sphere of activity, we had clients, service providers, we were supporting participants, we kind of achieved our initial goal. Um, and then we had an opportunity to validate those concepts by engaging with our second big funding program because we'd broken the chicken and egg problem. We had enough service providers engaged with us, we were able to convince a state government entity that they should trust us to be their planning platform of choice. Um, so it was a very exciting day for us, obviously, as a business, um, but it was kind of indicative of that strategy of try and win one side of the chicken and egg, you know, get your eggs first and let them grow into chickens. Um, and so that's kind of what we did. So we had acquired enough service providers, we could prove ourselves that we won uh, the right to start offering 
services directly to a government funding model. And they wanted us to become their official claim submission platform. So if we go back to sort of this high level view of our system, we introduced a new stakeholder, the, what we called the program, which was the entity that actually had the money and set the rules around you know, who should get paid. So they wanted an API and they wanted the API to do a lot of things. They wanted to have the ability to onboard providers who were already using them and mark them as, as approved. They wanted the ability to onboard known participants. I've put asterisks there because those are not the words that they used, unfortunately. But this is getting to the title of the talk. Um, they wanted to be able to keep items and prices in sync. Uh, they wanted to receive reports about what payments we had made on their behalf. So they actually wanted us to start making payments for them. So if we go back to our original context map, I've updated the operations layer to incorporate the changes the, that we evolved through phase one. And you can sort of see this is where the, the state of the system at this time, we had built out most of the operations layer. We built out the administrative layer for providers. So we'd split that initial provisioning concept as kind of a, a placeholder into separate context for onboarding providers and one for onboarding programs and their data. So we needed to build that one to start onboarding program data um, and settlement because they wanted to start getting paid. So once again, we came back to our original vision of the context map and went, hey, great, our new client needs these features. We already had a placeholder for fulfilling that function. It all seems to still fit together. This is awesome. So we did have to make some tweaks to the claims engine. And oh, I've got my slides out of order, I think. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, oh, what have I done here? So I accidentally delete a slide. The problem that we had was, is it embarrassing? I think I might have accidentally deleted a slide. The problem we had, I'll just talk to it. As I alluded to on this slide with the asterisks, the language was different. The language was very different. They did not um, just call them service providers. They called them, uh, sorry, they didn't just call them providers. They called them billing providers and service providers. So they had separation between the entity submitting the invoice and the person doing the work. The person doing the work might be a doctor with a Medicare license number, and they wanted to track that license number, even if the person worked for other companies. Um, they wanted to track the business identity number of the company that was submitting the invoices in case that business was engaged in nefarious fraudulent activity. Um, for participants, they wanted to track, uh, they called them clients, not participants, of course. Um, and they didn't call them claims either. They called them invoices. They didn't have the concept of claims. It was an invoice and a line item, and that's what they called it. Whereas the first uh, organization we were engaged in would exclusively call the claims and didn't care that it was collected into an invoice. It was just one line item at a time. So that was what we had to change in the claims engine. We, we started to realize that there were actually two languages going on. Now, the guidance of DDD is that if you've got a new language, you've got a new context. But the claims engine was our core domain. It was our key value proposition that we had these rules. We were very nervous about having to build a completely new context for every program. If Just because they had different terminology, should we, option one, build a completely new context for every program? Or should we, option two, try and find a unified language? So we decided, rightly or wrongly, to go for a unified ubiquitous language. And it wasn't necessarily that we knew that that was the right decision. It was a bit of a gamble. I think sometimes you do have to make a bit of a punt on these things. You can't know in advance which one is the right decision going to be. You sometimes have to give it a try. But at least because we knew there was a risk, we went into it with eyes wide open. We were paying attention to the cognitive load of having terminology that started to differ between our context and our code and our customers. Um, and we were paying attention to you know, the impact of that on support activities and on sales activities and on our developers. So the the glossary or the ubiquitous language that we came up with was and so the program is the funding organization which might be an insurer or a government agency um, the biller is the taxable entity providing the surface it might be the same as the provider if the provider is an organization so if the if there's no individual that anyone who cares about the provider was actually the person providing the service if it's a registered or the entity providing the service it could be an individual if they have a registered healthcare provider identity like a, a Medicare number or a, um, an APRA number, but it might be an organization if, for example, it's a, a taxi service and they don't care who the driver is um, or a construction service. Uh, an invoice was a collection of claims and a claim was an individual line item for a given um, unit of work. And yes, we kept the term client for the individual receiving the services, but we also realized that there was an opportunity for us to track a client as a person 
and their membership with the different funding programs separately, because it might be possible for an individual to be receiving funding from both a private insurer and a government agency at the same time. We thought maybe it would be interesting for that person to have visibility across all their activity. As it turned out, it ended up not being interesting or to the extent it added a lot of complexity into our commercial relationship. So we ditched the concept of client and focused just on membership. And so if we were, if the same person did have a relationship with two funding programs, we, we stopped knowing or caring about that. So if we go back to uh, the internals of the claims engine, the other really significant issue, there were a couple of other rules that we had to add and a bit more sort of reference data that we had to include, but the really significant thing was that they did not care about the sufficient funds rule. All that time and energy that we spent designing an accounting model to support the um, you know, transaction consistent balance check was actually irrelevant to this funding provider. They didn't set an initial budget. What they did was they said, spend as much as you want and we will monitor that spending over time and if your spending varies too much over time from the expected trajectory of your spending, we will start to ask some questions. Not a bad way to do it, really, like quite smart. Um, but it meant that there was no hard limits on their budget because they weren't coming at it the same way as the disability organisation, which was about, hey, we want you to have a budget. We want you to have control over how you spend that budget. They want, these guys wanted to have more control, but counterintuitively had realised that not putting a limit allowed them to have that fine-grained control because they could track spending over time. And they knew that for a particular type of injury, a person should spend most of the money within the first two months and then the spending should drop. So if they were still spending money after three months, they would that would raise some red flags in their fraud system. So it was pretty smart, but it meant that we were starting to realize that there were some rules that weren't necessarily relevant. So how did we solve this? Well, I'd like to say that we immediately went and revamped the whole system based on the new knowledge that we had, but we didn't feel we had enough knowledge yet to actually do that. So we made a point change, which unfortunately did add more complexity into the claims engine. We added a field for balance check required, true or false. So anytime you have a flag on an entity saying true or false, which changes its behavior, probably a bit of a red flag that you're missing a more fundamental modeling concept. Um, and I think at the time we kind of knew that we had missed it, but we didn't yet know what we didn't know about how to actually break that down into the, the modeling concepts that we needed. So we decided to give it a try and with the commitment that we had to evolve it over time uh, as we learned more. So in this case, if there's no balance check required, it would start at zero and just go negative. And it would just infinitely go negative without ever hitting a limit or caring what the balance was. So you might even ask why we're we even bothering to track the balance and the journal entries against that. And that's a very good question. So finally, we get to phase three. We have um, our two, you know, our initial concept. Um, we sort of like, validated it in some respect, we were able to provide the service to this company and they were actually really happy with it. They loved what we had delivered. We were starting to see some cracks in the design though. Rules that didn't necessarily work or didn't work, flags that we had to add, um, things that we thought had been, were an essential part of the service that actually were irrelevant to these people. So finally we got our third big client and this really changed the landscape for us. So if you really zoom out, this is kind of a, an illustration of what things looked like for us. We had our, um, our platform in the middle. We had a whole bunch of service providers submitting claims. And we had funding schemes at the top who were making, um, you know, we, we were basically telling them we had approved the claim. We evaluated all of your rules for you. We're about to send some money out the door from your bank account. So that's the thing. The work looks correct. We're going to send some money from your bank account. And, and this was working really well for the first couple of schemes that we had. But then the third scheme came along and they gave us their rules, we implemented them, kind of went through a similar journey to what we went for the second scheme. There were a few more little tweaks and adjustments and flags being added that meant that there was a bit more creaking going on. But again, we were just sort of monitoring to see like what fell out of this in terms of helping us identify what should the model really be. And, and, it, and the, the hint there was that we were evaluating the rules, as I said, we were sending the data up to them and they were re-evaluating the rules. And sometimes their decision was different to our decision. Sometimes it was because there was some delay in synchronizing the reference data. Remember all that reference data I said that the rules were being checked against? Sometimes it was rules that they hadn't explained to us properly and that they were evaluating differently. And this got really, really complicated very quickly and it led to reconciliation issues and the customer was really not, not happy about it. And what we realized was that actually they didn't want us to do the rules at all. They only, we were only doing the rules because we just told them that's how our platform worked. And when we asked them what they really would have wanted, what they really wanted was the ability to send back to us a message saying, yes, you should pay this or not, completely moving the authorization process out of our platform. And initially 
we thought, well, that's not good because that's our core value proposition. But actually, as it turned out, our core value proposition wasn't that. Our core value prop was that we had integrated with all of the service providers and the service providers were happy that we'd integrated with all of the funding schemes. So we went back in and actually, as it turned out, they didn't want these rules at all. There's a different way of visualizing the thing I just said. Um, so what did we do? We took our V1 system, which was effectively an approval engine, a decision-making engine, as it came to be known, an adjudication engine. And we moved that up into the layer and treated it as a proxy for the, the program. And then we built a V2 that was more of a routing engine. It wasn't a decision engine. It was a whole bunch of stuff flowing in, a whole bunch of stuff flowing out. So it would make decisions about who should authorize it. It wasn't doing the authorization. It was just deciding who should authorize it. And it was, it had a state machine that was tracking once all of the various decisions have been made, when do we facilitate the payment? So we would actually send a message up saying, can you check the claim and let us know if it's approved? And if it was, then we would pay the money out to the service provider. So what, what this meant was that we kind of had a hybrid. Remember that decision I had option one with two um, contexts, one per program, and option two with a unified language? We had a bit of a hybrid of that. We had a layer that had a unified language. This is like our routing capability. And then we had adapter layers for each of the programs. So what the first adapter layer was our actual V1 system because it had already been built to do decision making for, for some of these programs. And we went back to those programs and said, well, actually, we're starting to move to a model where you guys make the decisions and we don't. And they said, actually, that's what we always wanted. <laughs> the only reason that they didn't do that in the first place is that they didn't have the resources at the time to build a decision making engine. But they didn't explain it to us. They just told us to build a decision making engine. So it sort of highlights that sometimes what people ask for isn't what they really need. Um, but as it turned out, they now had that facility and we were able to migrate them off that. We built a dedicated adapter for them that didn't make decisions, but just translated from our language to their API language. And we just committed to, for every program that came on, either they could connect directly to our API or we would build an adapter for them that was just a lightweight anti-corruption layer between our core platform um, and their APIs. So what did that look like internally in our V2 context map? It was a little bit similar, but not quite the same. And to some extent, we found that with this version, we didn't need those responsibility layers so much. It had helped guide us in the start, but it was time to let go of it. Um, and so one of the key insights that we made is that having separate contexts for the different apps that we had, while it was helpful, um, it, it added a lot of complexity into the interaction between the contexts. And, and actually a better model was to say, treat those apps as actually separate systems. So much like we had um, some service providers who were able to integrate with our API directly, we would offer our app to other service providers as though it was like a hosted version of the systems that the other service providers were using. And so our app was changed and we built a new version of it that would then integrate with the same API that the providers that had built integrations were using. So that simplified that layer. We built a new context called invoicing um, that was really just a state machine of tracking, like, was the invoice processed yet or not? And when it was fully processed, um, oh, sorry, in the, in the act of processing it, we built this notification hub context, which was really the thing that would make the decision around where to go. And I put a webhook layer on there because the key that unlocked this and made it work is that the interactions back and forth allowed, were allowed to be eventually consistent and event-driven through the use of webhooks with both sides. So we would have an invoice would be submitted, it would raise an event that would get translated by the notification hub into a webhook out to the funding program. The funding program would come back with a decision you know, authorized or declined, um, that decision would then get communicated back to the service provider via another webhook. And this eventually driven, eventually consistent event driven architecture using webhooks for interactions with other systems just ended up working beautifully. Um, so I want to sort of close by drawing attention to this quote from Eric Evans' book. A team committed to evolving order must fearlessly rethink the large scale structure throughout the project life cycle. The team should not saddle itself with the structure conceived of early on where no one understood the domain or the requirements very well. That was exactly the situation we were in. Unfortunately, that evolution means that your final structure will not be available at the start, and that means you will have to refactor to impose it as you go along. It's gonna be expensive and difficult, but it is necessary. And I'm happy to be uh, someone who can report that having followed this advice, I wholeheartedly agree with it. It was difficult, um, not so much in the building of it. Once we decided to build V2, it was so freeing to be released from the constraints of V1. 
to build a new platform in Greenfield with latest technology um, was lovely. And we rolled it out incredibly quickly because by that time we knew exactly what it had to do. Um, and eventually, it took a few years, but we've actually, as far as I know, the V1 code is now 100% gone. It's not in operations, not in production at all, completely deleted. And, and we're really happy about that. And it was only made possible by the commitment to following this advice, to not saddling ourselves with the preconceived architectural notions that we had at the start of the project. You want that true false check? Yeah, got rid of it. <laughs> Gone. <laughs> well, no, so I see what you say. Ah, yeah. Um, okay, we made a commitment to evolve as we went, but not prematurely. I think that's the balance, right? Like, as I said, when we put the true false check in, we knew it was a hack, but we didn't know what the right solution was. So I think if you do put those hacks in, they either become a learning opportunity or they become technical debt that plagues you forever. And the question is, what do you do with them over time? If you treat them as a temporary hack and say, as soon as we know what this should be, we're going to change it, you end up where we ended up. If you go, oh, that's how it is now, we just have to live with it, then that becomes the thing that all of your future employees complain about and all the people that come after you say, oh, what were the idiots that designed this system? So this, I think, you know, a lesson learned, um, and I'm so grateful that I read Eric Evans' book at the start of this project and really had the opportunity to put it into practice in a hardcore way. So the last thing I'm going to say is, having gone through this journey, I've now partnered with Ardling, who are in, uh, based out of Europe. They run the Domain Driven Design Europe conference, and I'm going to be offering their training course in Australian time zones. It's a remote course, so it'll still be on, um, uh, you know, I think Zoom or something, using Miro and whatnot. Um, but at least it's in a time zone that's accessible to Australians because all their other courses you have to wake up at two o'clock in the morning for. <laughs> so if anyone's interested in this, uh, let me know. Google um, Ardling or Google Chris Simon Strategic Domain Design and um, let me know if you're interested in signing up and I can, I'll see if I can hook you up or uh, you can just sign up on the form there. So yeah, thank you very much. That is the talk. Question. A quick question about how advanced should you be in your domain for design? You know, oh, for you. This is good for beginners. Yeah, no assumed knowledge. It's um it is strategic level, so it's more focused on like identifying bounded contexts and uh, um, you know, those sort of like high-level decisions. It's not like hands-on code. It's not how do you implement the design in code. They they do offer other training courses in that. Um, but I haven't had a conversation with them about doing that yet, but I think this is the one they wanted to start with, and maybe next year if this goes well, we can we can start offering more. Um, but yeah, no, so it's high level, but it's definitely fine and appropriate for people who are just starting on their DVD journey to, to engage with. I believe so. I'm actually, in a couple of weeks, about to do the training necessary to <laughs> learn how to deliver this training. Um, I mean, obviously, I know the concepts really well, but I'm, I'm going to be teaching their training packages, packages, so I don't know exactly what's in the details of their training packages, yeah, but to be honest, isn't it? Were you following, it seems like you were following a waterfall SDFC, but as you would have benefited from an agile methodology. Um, no, I think we were using agile. What makes you think it was waterfall? So the question was, it seems we were following a waterfall methodology. Because uh, your iteration was uh, not developed one part of one component, Oh, sorry, you were developing one component or one feature at a time, mm -hmm. and then you had to roll it back. Yeah. Whereas in Agile, I think you do it in short sprints, a very small stuff component of a component. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. I, I think the, the challenge is obviously explaining this was an eight year journey, you know, breaking it down. So we, have, we actually did sprints. Um, so we were releasing every week and eventually every day with multiple times a day. Um, but the key milestones were when we had delivered enough to get feedback from customers because customers you know if, if it didn't have enough they, they wouldn't get value out of it so there was like thresholds beyond which customers were willing to engage at which point we would get feedback um, but absolutely we were releasing it frequently we we're getting feedback on user experience you know do you like the screen how does it feel but until there's enough core value they couldn't get the outcome they needed whether it's money moves or balance has shown. But we actually, we launched the, that, when I showed that slide where we said we focused on this component first, we launched that in a month and we had customers using it like a week later. So that, I think that's pretty agile. <laughs> okay. There's a question. I just wanted to ask, did you 
you think that um, the management design is more conducive for project sort of focus mindset around planning of uh, budgets? Mm -hmm. Or do you think it's more towards like a product mindset? I think I think it can be used in both settings. Absolutely. I think it works best with an agile iterative mindset because it really does like so agile doesn't mean no upfront thinking right it means enough up upfront design to get started and as i showed we did have an upfront design it was a high level abstract one with placeholders we had a general organizing principle that allowed us to make decisions as we went um, but we didn't spend like months on that it was literally the work of a day to come up with that initial concept um, which is how you know it was going to be wrong right <laughs> but it gave us a structure that allows us to to learn what we needed to learn um, so I guess to go to the question I think you can absolutely use DDD in a project mindset but you lose that opportunity to iterate necessarily as you learn as you go and I think DDD is really about embracing the fact that you are going to learn there's a there's a great section in the blue book about knowledge crunching where he talks about a project where they got to like three weeks from the end of the project and realized that their whole model was wrong and they were in a product project mindset they only had so much budget left and they were about to run out and the engineers went to the project manager and said look we've just come up with this new idea if we scrap it all and restart it'll be so much better can we do it and in the book he says i'm so grateful that the project manager had the trust in us to let us do it because it ended up being really successful um so i think but that's i think an unusual situation in a project world um, where there's a lot of sunk cost fallacy and people struggle to go back on the things that they've done, whereas in an agile, iterative product approach, you know, as soon as you learn something, you've got the opportunity to, to iterate and include it. So yeah, we were, we were changing our minds a lot through this project as we learned new things. Yeah. Uh, a lot of examples that I, I end up reading that's kind of like product or there's a very manual form of the product mm. and you've got your the main expert, you ask all the questions, do all your events for me. Yeah. Turn that into the you know the codified version. Mm. It doesn't sound like you have that being at a, a quite a new yeah uh, new solution, uh, solution to the marketplace. What did you do then? Did you have to just rely on your own imagination to sort of be on the, the domain? Yeah. Everywhere? So the question is in, our, in our, a lot of the guidance from. Um, the DD literature is you know gather all the domain experts in a room and do your event storming and your domain modeling and then turn that into code. And, and we didn't have that opportunity. Um, look, absolutely, we uh, we did have to become domain experts. We did as much as we could engage with customers, uh, invited them to workshops and discovery sessions, collaborative modeling um, exercises. Uh, but it, it, we were not just becoming our own domain experts, but we were we were co-creating the domain itself because until our product existed the workflows that it would support weren't possible so if we had just taken the workflows that they were doing and automated them it wouldn't have been as effective a product so we had to imagine like what is technically possible what can we do with technology now to improve their workflows and we collaborated with them to say would you like it to work like this how you know when we engaged with that first big government agency we had like a week long work workshopping section down in their offices where we went through all these scenarios and modeled all the use cases and everything um, but then we had to work out how do we generalize that into a SaaS platform? So that was on us to do. And that was where we had to make decisions around what's our, our ubiquitous language because there's and our other customers don't align. So it's a bit of both, I guess. Like it's definitely a lot of modeling with customers, but ultimately because we weren't building a project for hire, we were building a product for ourselves. Ultimately we had to own the decisions around, you know, what language to use and what the architecture was which meant effectively becoming our own domain experts. But over time, the business grew as we hired customer service people, as we hired salespeople, operations staff, they became our domain experts as well because they were speaking to customers constantly and would give us feedback and we would start to talk to them as proxies for customers, still try and get customers in when we could. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of collaborative work the whole way through the journey. Another one. Yeah, sorry, now, way earlier in the... Thing one of you talk, you talked about um, you had that idea of um, sort of the engine that popped out, and you decided you had mm. too many responsibilities in in sorry, what was the name? Of the yeah, we called it the claiming context, and then we split it into claiming and claims engine. Yeah, I was wondering what were the, like the, the signs that you had an overload 
all the hints that told you that that split needed to happen? Yeah, good question. Um, I might go, if I can go back to the... Uh, back. No, that's all right. Um, I deleted a slide in the middle there. Oh, here it works. This is it. Um, oh, cool. This works. Uh, yeah, so the hint was we had API calls coming straight in, and then we had um, messages flowing over here. So, sorry, the question was like, what was the hint that this claiming context needed to be split into? And so when we started to build the workflows to allow the messages to flow in, there was a lot of duplication of activity in here between handling the API calls and handling the messages. They're in different formats, different structures. The API calls were made up of natural keys. So like, you know, ID numbers that people knew and, and looked at. The messages were made up of GUID's private primary keys. Um, so there's a lot of translation and a lot of, like effectively duplication of functionality. And it was, and then that was sort of the hint that Hang on, what's going on here? And when we dug into it, we realized that actually there were these two responsibilities and then there was the rules. And, and then effectively, there was a third one, which was handling these messages and passing them out to the rules as well. So we kind of saw that there was these natural seams in the code where there was all these code classes associated with the rules evaluation, all these classes evaluated with the, like, the message processing, and all these classes associated with the API call, like effectively the natural key translation. Um, and we thought, okay, these are good scenes to split apart. So it was kind of like starting to see that, hang on, why do we have to write more code here? This is already does this, doesn't it? Oh, hang on, it doesn't quite do it. It's a bit different, but it's the same goal. What's going on there? That was, I think, the heuristic that prompted us to dig into it deeper and work out it needs to be split. There's some questions on the chat. So Stephen Smith says, projects are voyages of discovery, both what the requirements that provide the users with optimal value, business value and for the team to continually allow better design and architecture to emerge with each iteration. Um, so I think that's probably in response to some of my pejorative comments about projects <laughs> versus products. Um, but yeah, uh, Stephen, I'd love to hear your thoughts on if you've seen projects go well in an iterative learning way. Um, that'd be great. And he's asked the question, did you develop ubiquitous language? Um, yeah, absolutely. So. There was a table on one slide where I showed what it ended up being. Um, and it was more complex than this because it was, you know, a language for each context, but just trying to illustrate the core concepts. Uh, yeah, this is it. So this was like our ubiquitous language definition. And we, and you'll notice that some of these terms were different. When we came up with this as a new unified language compared to our first version, we actually went through the whole code base and renamed everything. So we made a commitment not to leave the old language lying around. Unfortunately, we forgot about the front end, but that allowed Fadila to have a great talk at <laughs> the start of tonight's session. Um, but yeah, the back end, we made a really firm commitment to, to keeping the language up to date and not just developing it, but evolving it over time as we as we learn new. But I think that the takeaway here though is that the ubiquitous language, you know, especially, you know, if you're building a product within a business, you can be ubiquitous within the business. If you're building a product for customers, odds are those customers aren't gonna just use the language you tell them to, and odds are they aren't gonna voluntarily share language between them. So at some point you have to accept the fact that your language is gonna be different to some of your customers' language. Um, and you know, this is just one example of the journey we went on to try and reconcile that challenge. There are a few people in the audience who were in the team for quite a few years. I don't know if you guys have any comments you wanna add on the the experience. Building version two was great. Building version two was great fun. Dealer says. Uh, mostly without any questions on how it would be applied in the context as to separate. So the experiment that I had was when you see the you know, responsibility in different contexts spreading around and then trying to do something that doesn't quite answer the problem, then it kind of gives you hints and this is this does fill in the end. Yeah. Uh, and it takes a time for you to figure out what's mm -hmm. It's like following the philosophy that one component to you do one thing. A single responsibility. So just for the people on online, uh, one of the audience members who was in my team at the time was adding his thoughts around the heuristics around identifying when to split contexts, and it was it was based around like seeing responsibilities spread out or 
being duplicated um, and someone else referenced the single responsibility principle effectively. I think the single responsibility principle is a good heuristic, but it's so often misunderstood because when you, it, there's a there's an implicit subclause to the definition, which is at the appropriate abstraction level, right? Single responsibility processing claims, that's one responsibility. But actually it's many responsibilities because it's receiving the message, it's translating the message, it's evaluating each of these rules. So you go down an abstraction level and you can say, well, this rule has one responsibility because it's to evaluate the rule. But then you go into it and it turns out that the rule has got like three different if clauses in it. So is that three responsibilities? Like the only line of code I've seen that genuinely has a single responsibility is let x equal one, right? Anything more complex than that at, at a very fine grain like level of abstraction has more than one responsibility. So I think this is why people get really confused about single responsibility because they're talking at different abstraction levels and not being explicit about what abstraction level they're talking about. So there's a really interesting, so single responsibility, I think you know, it's part of solid. Um, there's an alternative that's been proposed by Dan North, who's the guy that invented BDD and he called it Cupid. Um, I can't remember what all the letters stand for, but I do recommend Googling it, Google Cupid Dan North. Um, he's basically said solid, was relevant a long time ago. It's time for a refresh. Um, and you can say like things like dependency inversion principle or inversion of control, like inverting against what they were inverting the standard way of doing things. Now they are the standard way of doing things. So what are we inverting? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so his his framework Cupid is, is more into I think the experience of working with the code um, rather than looking trying to find like you know, analytical techniques around it because of things like SRP being difficult to quantify um, depending on the abstraction level. But anyway, I do recommend looking at Cupid. Maybe we'll do a talk about it one day. Santos, you're volunteering? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting topic. Yeah. Very surprising. Yeah. Uh, very uh, just regarding responsibilities, whatever we are talking about responsibility, you know, DDD context, we are talking about responsibility from every point of view. Mm. Right? So when you look into the code and you say, well, if this is that, and if that's that, I'm going to do this. Then that's kind of indication that aggregate is doing too many things. Like, why why are there too many conditions over here? Mm -hmm. right, so, and that kind of gives you a feel, or it's not logical or natural over here. That kind of gives you a feel. So I was just talking about uh, looking at single responsibility from the perspective of an aggregate. Uh, I think transactional consistency plays a lot there. Like, does it need to be transactionally consistent? Are there ways for it not to be? you can slice it thinner if it doesn't need to be transactionally consistent. Um, Steven's pasted, thanks, uh, thanks Steven, the Qubit, Qubit property. So C is for composable. Things can be composed together. They play well with others. The Unix philosophy, everything does one thing well. Sounds like SRP to me, but it's um, more that sort of uh, borrowing from Unix. Predictable, does what you'd expect. Idiomatic, it feels natural in the environment. So using the idiomatic features of the language, I guess. It's domain-based. The solution domain models the problem domain in language and structure. So the D in Cupid is domain driven design. Yeah. Uh, excellent. We are getting, I think, close to time. We're about to get kicked out of here. So thanks so much for your questions and for coming on tonight. Please do join us again in the next in two months and, uh, and join us on the live stream for the Melbourne talk. I think that'll be a really good one too. And yeah, get your friends to come along as well. People from your, your business if they're interested in doing better software design. And uh, yeah, thanks very much. We'll leave it there.